very, very interesting for some reason for me. So, yeah, that's what I do on my spare time when I'm not <laughs> editing or working or listening to uh, audiobooks is I'm watching video essays on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Hello Fun Facts fam, this episode is another new friend. This friend is a professional, classically trained chef. He's really good at explaining food safety and some neat and simple recipes. So put on your thinking caps, grab your favorite beverage, or even your favorite meal, and get it ready to play along at home here on Fun Facts with... Jeff Room. All right, so I have a couple of questions for you first before we get started, so that way my audience can get to know you a little bit better. Question number one, what makes you feel inspired? These days, I'm really inspired by other creators and the content they put forward. Like, content creating is totally new to me. Like, probably, I want to say this summer is when I truly started creating actual content, not just trends and lip syncing on TikTok. Prior to that, I had very little social media presence in the world that was public. Um, but I get, I get really inspired by others and, and what they put forth and, and the ideas that they like to put across and how they like to teach others. Like that is where I've found my niche on this app is educating other people about various subjects, not just cooking. Nice. Um, what is your best tip for making the world a better place? literally just do on the golden rule do on to others as you'd have done on to you like if everyone just stopped for like 30 seconds and thought about what they were saying and how it would feel if that was being said directly back to them i that's it like i re i truly like i don't want to be wishy-washy and 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 preachy but i truly believe that if people thought for two seconds about what they were saying and how it would feel if it was being said to them that there'd be a whole lot less problems. Absolutely. What would you pick for a last meal? Oh my gosh. So I have discussed this so many times, but Billy really hit it home. And I'm just like, that truly was my favorite thing. So absolutely. I love Southern cooking. I have no Southern roots at all in my family tree. Like my experience with the South has just been from traveling, but culinary school, when we did Ameri Americana and we cooked in this cooked southern food like the day I made homemade fried chicken on top of the stove and we had collard greens and homemade pan gravy and mashed potatoes I was in heaven so if I had to pick it would definitely be homemade fried chicken biscuits gravy collard greens and then dessert would end up being my grandmother's carrot cake which I'd have to make myself because nobody else can make it <laughs> yeah um so yeah, I completely understand that. Southern comfort food is is where it's at. Uh, and then the other weird question I have for you, what is one minor opinion that you have that everyone else disagrees with you on? Oh, which one could I pick? Um, this is hard. Um, This is the first one that pops into my head just because I get ripped apart for it and I've gotten ripped apart for it on TikTok. Um, I think The Princess Bride is extremely overrated. I'm not saying it's a terrible movie, but the cult following it has, I'm just like, I, I don't get it. Like, if someone puts it on, I'll watch it. But like, I'm not like quoting line for line. Like, I don't, I love all the actors that are in it and their characters are pretty cool and how they play them. But Princess Bride, Take it or leave it. I, I don't get it. I don't disagree with you. I mean, <laughs> I'll definitely watch it. Like, I find it watchable, but it, it's also, it, it's not the best movie ever made. No. Yep. And then, uh, where can you be found or followed on social media if you would like to be found or followed on social media? <laughs> so the only place you can truly find me on social media is on TikTok, uh, ChefRu5. Um, I've developed a little bit of a following, so I, I don't like to think of myself as a big creator at all, because I'm not. Um, 
this weekend I got taken out by a head cold, so I produced nothing. So I'm not dedicated to creating, but um, I have a lot of fun with it. And the people that have found me seem to fall in line with how I, how I present myself and how I create. So, I mean, I like what you create so far. Oh, right. So the three categories I have for you are history, food, and potpourri. Which category would you like to start off with? Uh, why don't we start with potpourri? Because I have a feeling that's going to be the one that sticks me. All right. And then I'm just going to really quickly go over the rules, even though you've heard it, just in case anyone's popping in new, coming from your page or something like that. Um, I have the three categories, each of which has three facts for you. And there's also a hint per category, just in case you need it, as well as uh, 150 50 you can use per game. Uh, you're trying to find the lie, which of these three facts is false. All right, so the three facts I have for you in the potpourri category are the scientific term for brain, fee brain freeze is cephenopalatine ganglion neuralgia. Two, Canadians say sorry so much that a law was passed in 1975 declaring that an apology cannot be used as an evidence of admission to guilt. And three, the only letter that does not appear on the periodic table is J. Oh, man. So... I know number one is true because I just learned that not too long ago. I know I'm going to be really sad if I get found out that I'm wrong, but I'm almost positive that number one is true. That's the scientific name for brain freeze. Um, number two completely is plausible, completely plausible, and I would believe it. But I will say I had, I really hope she's not listening, the worst chemistry teacher ever. And this woman was a genius. Like, she worked for a giant corporation before she became a teacher, and she created chemicals that are used throughout the, the industrial world. Um, she was an absolute genius, but she couldn't teach to save her life. And I'm mm. sorry. I'm sorry you know who you are, and if you're seeing this, I apologize now. Um, so the only reason I passed that class was because the salutatorian and the valedictorian from my class sat in the front seats on either side of the room, Mm -hmm. And we literally all just copied off of them. Like you, everyone sat like this in their desks so you could look over their shoulder and you'd write down, everyone copied off the two of them and it just filtered around the classroom. <laughs> um, so I really don't know if a J appears on the periodic table and I'm like trying to go through elements now in my head. And I, all right, so I'm going to go with one clue, one clue. All right. So the clue for this is, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right so from that i'm going to conclude that the i'm sorry is definitely it totally sounds plausible that they would have to create a law that would say just because someone said i'm sorry does not mean they're guilty which would work well throughout the rest of the world if that was a thing so i'm going to go with there is no so it was there is no j on the periodic table that was the the fact yeah so I'm going to say that there, that's, that's the lie. There is a J on the periodic table. Are you sure? Is that I'm your final sure, answer? My, my logic is taking over and saying the other two have to be facts. So I'm going to say that, yeah, J does appear on the periodic table. That is incorrect. Ah! Um, yeah, no, uh, the false one is actually that Canadians say sorry so much that a law was passed in 1975. <laughs> A law was passed saying that sorry cannot be used as admission to guilt, but it was passed in 2009, not 1975. Oh, okay. All right. All right. And that then, makes yes. sense because why in the 70s would they do that? Because the 70s weren't litigious so right. as much as they are now. So that makes sense. All right. And then, uh, yeah, the scientific term for brain freeze is uh, cephenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. So what are you drinking? Um, so I am not a hard liquor connoisseur at all. And up until probably four years ago, I couldn't touch whiskey with a seven foot pole. Um, but I am drinking uh, Fireball. And only because of this lovely head cold. And it's the only thing 
that is making me feel like a human at the moment. <laughs> um, I can't remember if it was you that posted about it or someone else, um, but someone said that they had a head cold and they were drinking uh, ginger tea. Yes, and that was me. That was Saturday. Was it Saturday night or Friday night? I just like this head cold is, is knocking me for a loop, and the I had a couple years ago. I went to the doctor and. I thought I had the flu, so I was hoping I would get Tamiflu and just get it knocked out. And she's like, no, you just have a virus. And I'm just like, great, what can I take? And she's like, the best thing you can do is double down on vitamin C. And like she said, start drinking specifically this uh, peach orange mango juice, which I hate peach. So it was like, that was torture. But in the end, it's actually delicious juice. She goes, it has like three times the value of vitamin C than, than most juices. I'm like, all right. And she goes... <clears throat> and make spicy, as spicy as you can stand it, ginger tea and add lemon to it and honey. And I'm like, okay. And it tastes, it tastes delicious and it does truly work. Like the, the ginger does reduce inflammation. And oh, then yeah. there was a study that came out a couple of years ago saying that there is evidence to show that whiskey, it doesn't cure the common cold, but it reduces the symptoms of a cold. And I tried it out one night. My wife took us out Christmas shopping we do like a marathon one night of shopping without the kids. We have mm -hmm. one of the grandparents watch them. And it just so happened the night we planned, I came down, <clears throat> excuse me, with head cold, very similar to this. And I just, I felt like the living dead, like walking, like I just, I felt miserable. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try it. We went out to dinner and I'm like, do you guys have, I prefer JD fire, but I'm also cheap. So I buy the fireball. Um, and they go, we have fire, we have fireball. I'm like, all right, can I have a shot of fireball? And I sat there and I started sipping it. And within 15 minutes, Mrs. Rue was like, you actually look better. I'm like, I'm starting to feel better. She goes, well, fire it back and make it work. I'm like, all right. So I shot it back. And truly within 20 minutes, I felt way better. Was I still sick? Absolutely. I still had the runny nose and my head was swimming, but I just, my body felt better. So like, I am tried and true on if you don't feel good, have some whiskey. Like, oh yeah. I mean, uh, I'm, I can't heavily day drink because I actually have to go to work after this. Um, but I have uh, coffee with just a little bit of, um, it's an off-brand Bailey's. All right. Which category would you like next? History or food? Um, let's go with history so I can finish strong, hopefully. All right. So the three facts I have in this category are, during World War II, France created a fake Paris in order to divert bombs from the real Paris. Number two, also during World War II, sauerkraut was renamed Freedom Cabbage in the United States. And number three, Nixon could play five instruments. Oh, let's see now. All right, so I'm almost positive I heard, I've heard about Paris having a fake Paris to divert from the raids, from the blitz. Um, the Nixon playing instruments, I would not be surprised because he. one thing I recently learned was he was a Quaker, which totally goes against everything he presented as himself as a president. Um, but I'm definitely going to have to say that uh, freedom kraut was not, uh, freedom cabbage was not a thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm that, definitely because I don't. I don't. <clears throat> prior to World War II, food was very much regional as far as being international. Um, you know, like prior to World War II, we didn't have massive commercialized international food. Like Chef Boyardee was created because of World War II and GIs coming home and wanting Italian, and it cracks me up that the Italian that they craved was <laughs> ended up being Chef Boyardee because. Let's face it, that's not Italian. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely going to say that uh, freedom cabbage was not a thing. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. That is correct. During World War II, sauerkraut and several other um, German-named foods were referred to as liberty base of that food. So Liberty Cabbage and Liberty Steaks instead of hamburgers. Um, this was because of anti-German sentiment at the time. <laughs> um, 
and it wasn't it wasn't like they rebranded everything like there's because again there wasn't mass produced things like that in stores but like when they would wouldn't make it at home or when they would get a new recipe for a friend they, they would here's my liberty cabbage recipe here's here's my liberty steaks recipe it's hamburgers oh. and yeah uh nixon could play five instruments the instruments he could play were the piano, saxophone, clarinet, accordion, and violin. Huh. And then, yes, during World War II, uh, France did create a second Paris, uh, complete with a faux Arc de Triomphe and even a faux Eiffel Tower, um, both of which were much smaller than the original. <laughs> um and it even had a lit railway that would attract the German bombers, and it was slightly closer to the Germany side there. So uh, what they would do is they would shut down all the lights of Paris at night and then light up this other town that they had built Amazing. in order to trick the Germans into bombing that instead of bombing Paris. Yep. The United States is weird. Oh my god, like, and just like in the last year, especially with TikTok, like, <clears throat> learning certain things that, you know, we just did not get in history class because it did not fit with capitalist America. It was just not something that we needed to know. And like, the things that I'm learning now as an adult, it's just like, huh, okay. So, yeah, Americans are not, we're just not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're not okay. We're not okay. We are not okay. Like my sister-in-law, she lived for um, at one time. She lived in uh, Ireland for about a year and a half, and people like literally ask her all the time, "Does this really happen in America?" And she'd have to embarrassingly say, "Yeah, that happens." Like completely true. And then um, when when my daughter was born. Um, she ended up getting stationed. Her company is international. She works um, in um, microbiology and her headquarters are in France. And she had to go over and live in Paris for six months or no, it wasn't six months, three months. And during that time, of course, Trump was president and people would like literally ask her and she go, Oh no, I'm totally embarrassed. I did not vote for him. I came from a state that staunchly voted him out, did not want him in at all. Like, mm -hmm. no, we most, a good portion of the United States is embarrassed by our president. Like, don't get us wrong. Like the people you're seeing defending him are not the majority. Yeah. They're just a very, very loud minority. No, they're the silent majority. Uh. <laughs> all right. And then the last category I have for you, Food. So the three uh, facts in this category are, one, the stickers on fruit are edible. Two, the Cookie Monster's cookies are painted rice cakes. And three, a human being can survive on a diet of raw turnips and butter. Man. Oh. Um... Yeah, so none of these are, uh, like, recipe science-based. Oh, no, definitely I, not. Like, this is totally, like, random factoids that should be living in my brain somewhere because that's literally all my brain does is absorb those things. Um, I was tempted to be, like, list the five mother sauces. <laughs> um, but Literally, but I, like, I, I thought not. I lost a job over that question. Like, that was when I left the restaurant industry. I will be completely honest. So, as a chef, I was trained... Um, I got my foot in the door. Like I graduated from high school thinking I was going to become a teacher. And that was when the reforms across the nation were coming. Thanks to no child left behind that teachers had to be certified and you're going to have to work ridiculously hard to get paid nothing. And I was in like my first couple of classes before I was, I was just like informational sessions pretty much. And they were talking about all the necessary requirements to become a teacher and I'm like I'm gonna work that hard to be that poor and so I was just like mm, no and so I and then long story short uh I went to school college in September of 2001 and I made the huge mistake of deciding to visit ground zero two weeks after the attacks 
Mm. And that totally threw my world into a downward spiral of, well, it could all end tomorrow, so why bother? And I ended up in a terrible depression, but um, ended up dropping out of school because of it and worked. And when I worked, I was working in a deli full time. And I thought to myself, well, I don't want to be a teacher and I'm pretty good at this. So I'm going to go into that. And I thought my intent wasn't to be a master chef and, you know, be a crazy culinarian. I wanted to run my own restaurant. So I was going to culinary school so that as a restaurant owner, when I hired my chef, he couldn't bullshit me and say, well, this is the way it's done. I would be like, no, I went to school. That is not the way it's done. And that was the only reason I truly went to culinary school. And I was fed culinary school. Their favorite thing to do is tell you, oh, when you come out of school, you're, you're, you'll be able to be a sous chef, which is true. You have all the knowledge and skills to leap forward and become a sous chef right out of culinary school. Because truly, that's what culinary school does, is it takes those 10, 15 years of experience you would get on the job and condenses it into a short period of time. But our industry still, no matter what, wants you to put in the work. Oh, like, yeah. You can have as much knowledge and expertise as you want. They still want you to get in the kitchen and sh prove to them that you can do the job. And so I went in into culinary school with only working in a deli that did some hot foods and then went to culinary school and literally, of course, the, it was terribly hard for me to find an internship. And oh, yeah. when I finally found my, the restaurant that would hire me, it was literally like a week before I had to have a job. Otherwise, literally, I'd flunk out of the program. And he goes, yeah, I'm tempted not to hire you because the last guy we hired from your school was a complete idiot. And I'm like, great. And so literally, I spent my first month proving I wasn't a moron to all my coworkers because of the bad uh, press that my predecessor had given them. So I worked in a restaurant for only nine months before I decided I did not want that life. It was counterintuitive to the life I wanted to have. Mrs. Rue would, had just graduated from college. She was a teacher. So literally during the week, we'd see each other for a half hour, if that, and she'd be too tired and go off to bed. And then on weekends, when she had time, I'd get off work after working 10 to 12 hours, and I'd be exhausted falling asleep in her lap. So I missed a lot of holidays and that was like a huge thing for me because I am a family person and I missed a lot of holidays. The breaking point was I was going to miss St. Patrick's Day and I ended up working a double that day and that's when I was like, that's it, I'm out, I don't want to do this and I went for an interview at a college to work in dining services to literally work the dream hours of a chef Monday through Friday, no nights, no weekends, no holidays like and the I walked into the interview and it was the first time I walked into an interview with more than one person. I had four people in the interview and I was just like completely str stricken. And they asked me, one the, uh, the production manager asked me, what are the five mother sauces? And I completely blanked. Like I was able to list hollandaise and tomato. And that was it. Like I could not name the rest of them to save my life. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I walked out of the interview thinking I failed it. I was done. Like, and then I got a second interview with the executive chef <clears throat> and I happened like, and I literally like studied them for like three days to find the mother sauces. And I saw the production manager. I'm like, Hey, mother sauces are, and he started laughing. He goes, he goes, we figured you were pretty nervous. I'm like, I really did know them. I promise you. So anyways, yeah. Um, so I would have to believe that. I, I want to believe that the rice cakes for cookie monster is true. And then, the stickers, they would, I mean, they're not edible in the sense of that you'd want to eat them, but I would think they'd have to be edible just for the simple fact they are on a food and the odds of someone actually eating the sticker are pretty high. So, all right, so why don't we go with the, the hint for this category? The hint is, well, let's get to the root of this problem. Okay, so I do know that you can survive on a diet of potatoes and butter. So I'm guessing that this lie is a, this fact is based off of that fact. And so that's the lie is turnips. I don't particularly know the nutritional value of a turnip. So I, I'm, I'm hesitant, but well, I haven't used the 50-50 yet. I'm really sad that I'm gonna have to use the 50-50 on this category considering I'm a chef. So why don't we go with the 50-50? Um, the Cookie Monsters cookies are actually painted rice cakes. Uh, the oil in 
chocolate in the chocolate chip cookies would actually cause damage to the puppet, especially at the rate and amount that Cookie Monster used to eat them. That makes complete sense. All right, I'm going to go final answer with yes, turnips and butter you could survive on. I don't, I don't think that's true. That is correct. Um, it is actually the raw potato based. Uh, while you probably could survive on turnips and butter, um, there is no scientific evidence to suggest that turnips have enough nutrition. However, raw potatoes contain enough micronutrients to keep you alive until you are in a place where you can start eating healthy again. Raw potatoes are also 75 to 90% water, depending on the variant. So if you are trapped in a desert with a large sack of potatoes and a couple of pounds of butter, you could survive relatively hydrated until you find your way out or are rescued. It'd be a very sad existence eating raw potato because that is just one of the worst flavors in the world. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yes, fruit stickers are edible. Uh, it is true that they are edible, but they are not intended for consumption. They are made edible as a cover-your-ass method only, so that the manufacturers of the fruit and companies and farmers cannot be sued if the stickers are accidentally consumed. You should still take them off of your fruit before eating it. So, something that, like, falls into that category... Um... One of the easiest garnishes I have, so I work on, well, worked, uh, haven't worked since March 26th of last year. Um, we have, we do catering on campus, but it's not a super ton, so I can't keep a lot of green type garnishes in house without them going bad. Mm -hmm. One thing that I can keep in house are orchids, and there's something you see commonly um, on buffets and especially like fruit platters because they don't wilt very easily. They don't turn colors, but they're just these purple orchids and they're food safe. And people all the time are like, are these edible? And I'm like, well, they have to be in order to be near the food. You can't. Yeah. Law dictates that anything that touches food has to be edible or food safe. I'm like, they're totally edible. I said, but you don't want to actually eat them. They're like, why? I'm like, it tastes like perfume, perfume dirt. Like, you get the perfume of the flower, I said, but literally it tastes like dirt. So you're eating perfumes and dirt. Like, that's what mm -hmm. it tastes like. And there's always somebody that, oh, like, yeah. has to prove me wrong. Like, and they pick up the orchid off the display and they pop it in their mouth and they're like, yeah, it tastes like perfume and dirt. I'm like, yeah, I, I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> like, have you ever just eaten a rose petal? Like, that's not great either. Just... Like, there are many things in this world that have a lovely smell, but does not mean you should eat them. Like, nope, nope, this, like, don't eat candles. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, like, chewing on wax, that's not going to be a pleasant experience for you at all. Uh, but yeah, nope, so you won, so you get to come on again and bring your own facts. Woo. Oh boy, I'm going to have to do a lot of research for this one. I mean, I have websites that I go to that are just, like, compendiums of just short facts and I just pull the short facts that I want and then I go and run fact check on them to make sure that they're actually true and okay yeah so it's a lot easier than you think it is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no uh, uh I'm uh, thank you for being on and uh, if you want to sit here and talk for another minute if that's perfectly fine oh sure well. I, yeah. I I am literally alone at the moment like so the last year, I have literally been quarantined to my house because, you know, I'm a good human and I'm trying to keep the world safe. This show is recorded, produced, directed, and edited by Connor J. Cassidy, with music by Sounds Like Sanders. Our podcast is hosted on podserve.fm, and our music was found via soundstripe.com. Please follow us on all social media at Fun Facts With, and if you like the show, consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, have a nice day.